Yeah, so thank you. I'm, I'm Nathan Wallach again, uh, and as uh, Geert uh, mentioned, uh, I teach at Stetson University. Uh, and I'm this year a Fulbright Fellow uh, to Norway, uh, working primarily at Beck on uh, this project, which is uh, granular extensions to uh, the Jamoma DSP framework. Um, I guess, could I just get a quick show of hands? How many people are familiar with Jamoma or have heard of it? Okay. Uh, and how many people are familiar with granular synthesis, processing, etc.? Okay, good. So I'll just do a quick, uh, I, I had a mild panic attack this morning and I realized I hadn't put anything in my slides about what granular processing was and I was, I was pretty confident that everybody knew, but just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I've already mentioned my bio, uh, uh, where I am now, but where I kind of came from, I did my PhD at Northwestern University in uh, Evanston, Chicago area. Uh, you've got my per current teaching post. I'll be talking a little bit more about my role as music director of Mobile Performance Group this afternoon. I'll play an example of uh, that's a laptop ensemble that my, my colleague and I have at um, Stetson University. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm privileged to be, a, uh, I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to be here in Norway for six months and work on my research uh, while taking a break from my teaching position. Um, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, what are granular techniques? Okay, we start with a source sound, okay, and note the time scale on the bottom there. We're talking about seconds, okay. Usually when we're talking about granular techniques, we zoom in, we start looking at very short time scales, and I realize those numbers are kind of small, but you notice we went from whole numbers to fractions of numbers, so we're on a very short time scale. Using that short segment, that we then combine it with a window function, okay, which acts as kind of a short amplitude envelope, and we produce a grain of sound. Okay, uh, very simply then we take these grains, sometimes dozens of them, sometimes hundreds of them, and we start to combine them and then we get larger macro effects basically as we are combining these short segments of sound. That's granular techniques in a, pro in a, in a nutshell. And I, I'm hesitating to call it granular synthesis. I'm, uh, I'm of the mindset that it's only granular synthesis if you're using kind of pure waveforms as your sound source. It's granular processing if you're using audio that you've recorded basically. Um, not everybody shares that distinction, so I realize that's why I kind of use a kind of an umbrella term of granular techniques. Uh, but more or less where all the work happens is at a, a little bit higher level, uh, and that's where kind of my project is. So um, I'm here giving a progress report on the project that I'm halfway through, basically. And so I, I don't, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll uh, I guess, deflate your uh expectations a little bit. I have no sound examples. I have nothing to play as far as like what sound I'm producing. So I thought it'd be a little more uh, interesting to kind of talk about how I got here basically. My journey with granular synthesis because my my name has uh, I guess consistently been associated with this technique um, and uh, I, I constantly am going to conferences and immediately as soon as people read my name tag they're like oh you're the granular toolkit guy basically. Uh, and so the question is how did I become uh, associated with granular techniques. How did I, how did I get here, basically? Uh, and including how did I get here to Norway, not how I walked, basically, but you know, how did I get to Norway being a Fulbright scholar? Um, really, my journey started uh, as a grad student. I was assigned to one of the composition faculty, Amnon Wollman, uh, who's uh, since left Northwestern, gone to Brooklyn, and now has left Brooklyn, and he's back in Israel working uh, and teaching. Um, but at the time, I was very fortunate to be assigned to him as kind of the, the technician on a composition project that he was working on. This is a very large-scale composition project, a 90-minute performance with singer, piano, uh, this, the piano was to be prepared and unprepared using mechanical devices. Uh, there were scrims, there was lighting, the audience was kind of in the round, it was a black box theater, it was a wonderful experience uh, working with him for over a year on this, on this project. Uh, but in the midst of working on this project, uh, we were do he, he was a Max user and he was comfortable with me as kind of a Max developer. Right? By this point, i had been using Max for probably three or four years. Uh, so I was pretty confident in my skills, but I learned so much in this project about being a Max developer, a Max programmer. Um, and it was in July in working on this project that he, you know, just offhandedly said to me, you know, I've been using this program called MacPod. Anybody remember MacPod or used MacPod, okay, back in the day, okay? Uh, Damien uh, Keller and, and Rolf, I forget Rolf's uh, first name, but uh, developed this. They were students of Barry Truax, so they were kind of building on his research and built, uh, created a nice little OS9 app that you could use to granularize sounds. Um, and he said to me, you know, I really like this thing. I wish I could actually granularize the singer's voice in real time for this piece. 
why don't you go work on that? And, and so I, being the good grad student that I was, went and start, you know, nothing's impossible basically in my mind. I go and I start working on that. Uh, and I came up with my first uh, real-time granulizer using strictly uh, Max MSP. Keep in mind, MSP was released, what, 97? So uh, this is before, I, I know, uh, later MSP introduced the stutter object, right, for doing granular processing. This is before the stutter object even existed, basically. Um, so I was doing kind of real-time granular processing in 2000 as part of this project, and it worked quite well. We were able to granular process uh, the singer's voice, have her pitch shifted up and down, and have these other uh, ambient effects that came from the singer's voice, basically. So really, I mean, my journey with granular synthesis started July 2000. I can trace it back to that moment where he said to me, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could granularize her voice in real time? You know, uh, and so off I went from there. Um, by February 2001, I, I had some other projects that people were, you know, as soon as people figured out I could do granular synthesis in real time using Max MSP, other people were asking me to build little granularizers for their projects. So I was like, well, you know, maybe this is going to be kind of uh, something that I can put together that I can share with folks. Uh, so by 2001 in February, I had the, the version 0.1 of the granular toolkit. Okay, uh, And this is actually a shot of, I believe, the, what was at the time the abstraction for the grain.stream object. So before they were externals, they were actually patches running as abstractions. Uh, so you can see some familiar objects here, of how I got it running, basically, to, to actually do the granular generation of each grain uh, in real time using uh, MSP objects pre-stutter, basically, okay? Um, by March, though, I realized you know, there were some limitations here. I couldn't ensure the, the things that I wanted to ensure with granular processing, uh, I couldn't get them to, uh, and I'll talk some more about these a little bit later in my presentation, uh, I wasn't happy with the way I was controlling the, 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 the various da data parameters, so I started the path of developing externals. I had developed one or two externals by this point, uh, one that actually uh, modif uh, used some, uh, uh, some tilt data that's used actually in uh, car alarm systems, because I thought that would be an interesting uh, algorithm to model inside of Max MSP and have things kind of trip based on movement of objects. Uh, and one that was a, just a constant power panner because there wasn't anything that was doing constant power panning at that point. So I, I said, well, let me start working on actually coding up some externals for this. So I, I mean, I started that process and you can see my code, I've got a lot of notes. I was pretty good about in my code documenting notes when I added things, when I deleted things, that sort of stuff. So it's been a, a good process to be a go through, back through those. Um, and by August 2001, so a little over a year later, I was releasing point, version 0.5 with externals that have been programmed in C and uh, and uh, ship that out kind of to the world through my website basically uh, giving it away um, and uh, as I, I've uh, constantly said to some of my students if you can find a way to give something away to the community that you're in uh, something of value uh, you will get so many things back in return uh, more than if you try to uh, sell it so I'm, I'm a big believer in at least you know, yes you have to sell some things and, and make money somehow uh, but find a way to give something away. Uh, I've, I've certainly found that it's been a rewarding process for myself. Um, so I then took a journey to Iowa. I was living in Illinois at the time, a grad student, which is the state next door, basically. Uh, Iowa is known for growing corn and farming, and, and it's an agri agri agrarian economy, okay? Uh, but they were hosting the Seamus Conference, which is the Society for Electroacoustic Music in the United States. Um, and I submitted a proposal to demonstrate my granular toolkit for Max MSP. I got accepted. I was very excited, a young grad student presenting at a national conference. Um, and I delivered my paper. And uh, there was a, a fellow grad student there by the name of Tim Place, which is a name that some of you have heard of. Uh, Tim Place, uh, responsible for tap tools, a very popular set of externals for Max MSP, uh, but also one of the lead uh, uh, developers for Jamoma project as well, uh, and has been here in Norway several times uh, develop, working on that. Um, so the first time, so from 2000 to 2002, this is the first time that Tim and I met, kind of bonded, and we've kind of worked together on and off ever since then. So this is before Jamoma, this is, but this is Tap Tools was about to come out, my granular toolkit was coming out. Uh, and we kind of uh, communicated and kept track of each other since then, okay? Um, by January 2003, I was releasing version 1.0, okay? And you can see this is where we start to get, I don't know, I, I started using it from the, 
Ho hopefully you see from the interface of the first uh, one, I started using color coding to kind of group parameters. Uh, this was my kind of crude interface design. I didn't study interface design, I studied music technology. So uh, there's some much nicer interfaces out there for granular processing these days. But I was trying to do my part and, and uh, get an interest in interface design and kind of grouping things together visually somehow. Uh, kind of. So um, by uh, May 2005, I was, def I was defending my dissertation. So I kind of uh, went down this path of uh, interface design, uh, and I kept thinking to myself that there's got to be a way to simplify this. Rather than having a row of a bunch of number boxes that you tweak and control, um, there's got to be a way to uh, simplify this. And actually, what I did was uh, some perceptual research. I played granular processing examples for people. Uh, and monitored their responses, uh, playing them pairs of examples and having them rank similarity of those pairs. Uh, and then I was able to come up with a perceptual map of how those examples related to one another using a process called multidimensional scaling, which is used in psychometric research, basically. Uh, and what I found was that the periodicity uh, was important and then the bandwidth. Uh, but in terms of duration, people tended to perceive more minimum and maximum dura du duration. So what I found up until that point was most software for granular processing either took this average and bandwidth approach or the maximum and minimum approach uh, for all parameters. And what I found was it was actually uh, psychoacoustically important to have average and bandwidth for the periodicity, but minimum and maximum for the duration of the grains. So that was something new kind of that I, that I showed through my re research. Uh, not only that, log two scaling ended up being important for duration, uh, which I think relates back to, because uh, the duration has kind of frequency effects. And so doublings and frequencies are important. Therefore, log two scaling becomes important when you're talking about the duration of these grains. And if I lost some of you, sorry, I got a little technical there, but some of you I saw nodding heads, so good. Some people got that. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of built this kind of crude uh, implementation trying to show uh, that it made it an easier uh, process of having the, having these sliders that could control two parameters at a time and having kind of a visual visualization of it. Um, if you recognize this, you may have been someone who was a user of Hypno, okay? Uh, this kind of found, at the same time that I was finishing up my dissertation, Tim had called me up and said, hey, I've got this uh, project that I'm working on, uh, a, a bunch of externals, but you're the guy that knows a lot about gr granular externals. I'd like you to develop some granular externals for this, and Cycling 74 is already on board, and we're going to release these things. So I started uh, migrating not only this interface, which showed up in the grain stream object, uh, the grain stream plugin, um, but also worked on several other granular uh, plugins for the Hypno collection. Um, got a lot of good publicity out of that, um, and a lot of uh, people. Uh, that that was, uh, I guess, uh, a one demonstration of how giving something away for free, my granular toolkit, led to a paid project, basically Hypno. Um, and uh, you know, got a little bit of money. I was able to pay for my uh, doctoral robes uh, coming out of grad school, which is no small feat for those of you that have those doctoral robes. They're they're not cheap. Uh, so um, you know, I, I'm happy to uh, get make a little money off of that and uh, have a, be involved with a commercial project uh, and be able to have my name attached to Hypno um, through that project. And I guess it also shows that the people that you meet at these conferences. I mean, I met Tim just what four years prior to this at that Seamus conference. Networking and working on projects is kind of an important thing. Okay, um, so I started doing some other things, some work with laptop ensembles at, at Stetson. Uh, and I actually took a few of my students to ICMC in 2006. It was in New Orleans, and so if you know your geography, New Orleans is not too far from Florida. It's about a 10 to 12 hour car ride. So we all piled in the car and we rode, drove over there, um, but. At that conference, uh, Tim was there again. We chatted, kind of updated each other, talk, uh, talked, and he was presenting a paper that he actually co-authored with Trondelosius. The first time I heard that name, uh, I'm sorry if it's a little pixelated up there. It looks beautiful on the screen here, so sorry about that. Uh, but I, I wanted a kind of icon to represent the paper there. Um, yeah, the, uh, the the first time I heard the name Trondelosius was at, at this ICMC conference. Tron actually wasn't there. Uh, Tim was actually delivering the paper uh, that they had co-written. Uh, and this is also the first time I heard of Jamoma. Uh, they were presenting Jamoma at that time as a modular standard, a way of structuring your max patches so that they were interoperable with other people that were building modular 
uh, max patches. And that sounded like a good idea to me. The kind of the seed was planted at that uh, listening to that paper. You know, I really should be doing that with these granular ex uh, abstractions, basically building them in this modular way so they're interoperable with other people. Um, but being that I was the one developer, I was working on so many other projects. I was a pre-tenure uh, faculty member, which is uh, uh, stressful enough as it is. Basically, I was working on a whole bunch of other projects. I never quite got around to it. Uh, not long after that, I released version 1.43 of the Granular Toolkit, which was actually the last version to be publicly available. Um, but and, and basically, this is where Granular Toolkit sat for a number of years and has sat for a number of years. Um, even uh, so, uh, when I did, I think, some uh, analytic data uh, in like 2010, 2011, I still found the Granular Toolkit was being downloaded about 200 times a month, which is pretty remarkable for you know, work that I did as a grad student starting back in 2000. Um, you know, it's to, for, to have it still be downloaded that much, uh, I thought, I, which was humbling to me that there's a lot of people out there still using it and still recommending it to their students as a way to kind of get going with granular techniques inside of Max MSP. Uh, but at the same time that I was kind of letting the, the granular toolkit kind of languish, Jamomo was growing. Jamomo was expanding. Jamomo went from this modular patching uh, environment to being all these different things to having the foundation and the DSP layer and now they have the audiograph layer and they can do multi-channel patching and all these cool things uh, and I kind of got I got jealous I got envious I'm like I want in on this basically you know uh, and I was looking at through the documentation looking on the the to-do list and I saw that one of the things that they had to do was developing some micro sound extensions which is a broader term right for granular techniques the DSP library currently doesn't have any microsound techniques. I'm a specialist in microsound techniques, this sound, and I have, I'm a good friend with Tim, so this just seemed like a win-win-win uh, for everybody if I got involved with this project. So uh, I did what everybody in academia does. You invite your friends in to, to give a lecture, okay? Uh, so Tim came down to Florida to give a lecture, basically, but the ulterior motive, um, which I was very open with my dean and everything, was to, for, us to, for him to give these lectures on, on a Monday, but then Tuesday I blocked off my schedule, and Tim and I sat down and we brainstormed. We, I have a really big whiteboard in my office, which I love, uh, and we wrote a bunch of things all over the, trying to figure out how we can, uh, I think, uh, as Tim kind of uh, uh, amusingly put it, you know, how to get our two projects to have a baby, basically, you know, get them together and hook them up and have them kind of go forward together. Um, so from there, um, I made the decision to go ahead and open source the externals. Uh, they had been closed source at that point. I, I mean, I people had asked me about them prior to that uh, the source, and I had been kind of. Uh, uh, willing to share with people if they were interested, but uh, I've since put the source for the externals, which was the only part of the toolkit that was closed um, uh, online. I haven't heard any response from anybody. Nobody's kind of picked up the ball and worked with it, but I've kind of, uh, that's, that was kind of my signal to the community that I'm moving forward now with doing microsound techniques inside of Jamoma. Uh, and if anybody needs these things, the source is up there, it's available, it's got a BSD license on it can do with it whatever you want basically but I'm moving forward to the next phase of my granular research basically so if anybody's interested you can go to my website nathanwallach.com or lowkeydigitalstudio.com there's two different ways to get the same website you can actually download the source and if you want to start a git project fine I'm working on other things basically um, so in October 2011, uh, we got together in Kansas City. This was the first time I met Trond. Uh, you can see him up in the upper right-hand corner. I don't know if he likes this picture or not. But, well, he's, he'll be famous now. Uh, and we gave a, a, a kind of a presentation of what we were doing. We played some music at a, at a conference, but we spent like three days working together. So you can see uh, next to immediately next to Trond is uh, Niels Peters. Uh, and then, then immediately the other side of that is Tim Place, basically. I snapped that kind of candid shot as we were about waiting for a, a table at a bar barbecue joint, basically. Um, and I thought it was fun that the, uh, the, the public transportation in Kansas City is known as the Max, uh, and we were there working on all these Max externals, so was, I, I found that kind of humorous. So I threw that, that picture in there, basically. Um, we got a lot of brainstorming done. I started kind of working on the, the windowing library for uh, Jamoma and extending that, adding some window functions into the library because that was important. Uh, but then I knew I had this sabbatical coming up, so I applied for a Fulbright. Uh, I found out in March that I uh, was awarded the Fulbright, and in August I arrived in Bergen and started working. 
Okay, uh, started. Uh, you know, they get, Beck was nice enough to give me a desk to work at, and uh, it's nice to, as artists, kind of come through there to hear what people are working on and get inspired by that sort of stuff. Uh, they did uh, ask ask me or give me an opportunity to, to put together a sound installation for them for this uh, Be Open event that was going on in the city. So that's the one artistic project that I've done while I'm here. But the rest of the time, I've been, uh, you know, nose to the keyboard, kind of working on code. Um, and so the question is, where is that at, basically? Where is this project? Okay, because this is supposed to be a progress report, if you remember the, the title slide, right? Um, so the key concepts that we're kind of carrying forward from the Granular Toolkit into Jamoma, okay? Uh, the, the, the thing that I had to, I, it took a lot of talking to Tim that back in November 2010 to, to kind of make sure that he had this understanding that, to me, the key thing about granular synthesis, what caused me to start building externals rather than relying on max, pa max and MSP patches, was that nothing can interrupt the grain once it starts. I think that was that to me is one of the things that distinguishes the granular toolkit from building your own patches. Uh, it's, I mean, you can kind of get it to work with snapshot and sample and hold algorithms, but there's always a chance that sometimes there will be a glitch in the middle of your grain, as opposed to the externals. I mean, I. I made darn sure those things, nothing interrupts the grain, unless you turn off the DAC, basically. Nothing changes the grain once it's in progress, okay? Yeah. So there was a lot of uh, receiving information, holding the information, waiting for the next grain that has to occur in order for that to be, to, to uh, assure that for your users, okay? Um, and so I'm working really hard to make sure that that's what happens in the granular extensions to Jamoma or Microsound or whatever label we end up putting on these things, okay? Um, one, we want to make sure there's a variety of control signals. I thought that was, it, I, I felt it was important to have different ways to generate grains, either with a bang or with phase so that you can assure that they're phase synced or just simply giving it a, a frequency if you want to have something spit out a, a series of grains or, or pulsing if you want to... Uh, if you, uh, the, I guess the difference between bang and pulse, I mean, ba bang is, is, is tied to the max scheduler, right? Uh, which has a clock of what is it? It, will dip, it can go down to uh, the sampling vector, right? So it ends up being somewhere in the neighborhood between 10 and 20 milliseconds. That's good enough for most people, but some people are, you know, like me, they want to make sure that it's really sample accurate. So the pulse lets you trigger a grain on this sample. So whatever the sampling rate is, you know that it triggered on that sample, basically. Um, so uh, important to have a variety of control signals. We want to have a variety of window functions. I'm kind of migrating. The, 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 the implementation in the granular toolkit is that you just simply use a second buffer and load your window. Uh, and I've, in talking to people, most people don't ever venture beyond the windows that are available that I've kind of pre-created in the uh, granular toolkit. So I'm moving away from the idea of having a buffer that you can just throw a window in and just having a bunch of windows available. All the windows that were available in the Granular Toolkit are already uh, available in uh, Jamoma. We've already got those locked down, basically. Um, but it's not going to be as open-ended. And if people, Although if I get response from people that, no, I really want to be able to you know, put in my own windows, uh, I'll, I'm more than willing to receive that feedback, okay? Uh, and the other thing is this double buffer scheme, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's a little, double buffering is a little more uh, prevalent in graphics uh, research, and I'll talk about how I've kind of taken that idea over to audio, okay? Um, the things that, um, that Jamoma enables in terms of in, uh, improvements, one is that the implementation is not exclusively uh, tied to Max. Well, in the actual C++ frameworks, I mean, they're... Uh, kind of platform agnostic, if you will. Uh, you can tie them into Ruby, you can tie them into Max, you could uh, compile them to PD, although nobody is currently uh, shepherding that project, basically. But uh, I, I like that about it. Uh, the, my previous work was too tied to Max MSP, and so if I wanted to do something else with granular techniques, I, I didn't have that ability to, to, to migrate the code. I would have had to start from scratch. These, are, these frameworks are C++ libraries, which you can hook into a variety of environments, okay? Um, easier to build inf interfaces. I'm still kind of in the back of my mind thinking to, I'm going to develop this killer app, although I saw a really nice iPad app from, what is it, Borderlands, which just recently was promoted. Man, I, if, if, that, if, I, if that's the bar I quit in terms of developing interfaces, I'm going to work on developing the, the back end, basically. Um, it's pretty nice if you haven't done a search for borderlines. Anyway, um, 
And also handling multi, the granular toolkit always was limited to mono. The buffers had to be mono in both cases. I never really got it uh, working with multi-channel uh, input files. And then also multi-channel output files. We've got this great idea that uh, using the audio graph, you can patch around multiple channels. What if each of those channels was a stream of grains and you could feed them to different speakers? I have some abstractions in the toolkit which allowed you to feed to different speakers, but the idea of just having one patch cord Man, forget it. That's that's real, that would be really nice. So I I kind of keyed in on this idea of nothing interrupts the grain once it's in progress, uh, and I want to make sure everybody kind of gets the implications of that. So the, the idea that all these, if you've worked with granular processing at all, you realize there's a lot of different parameters, right? Uh, you've got to make sure that you receive that information and you wait, okay? By f and so all these different parameters, the duration, the gain, the pitch, the window shape, you have to wait if something, if a new change comes in for the next grain. That's the trick. That's what is so much easier to implement in C, C and C++ code than it is in a Max MSP patch. Okay? Um, and by far the hardest of these is if the source sound changes. If someone changes the source sound on you, you want to make sure that you finish the grain and then with your next grain, you start using the new source sound. That's where this idea of uh, double buffering comes in that I, that I related to, okay? And I kinda had this, I, I, I mean, I, 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 not kinda, I had this working in the granular externals, basically. It basically, when you send a, you know, uh, change, uh, set buffer to this new name, it basically holds onto that information and it waits for the next uh, information. But uh, we, we kinda liked that idea in talking and brainstorming with uh, Tim and Tron and, and the guys, the idea that uh, what if all of our buffers in Jamoma were double buffers, okay? So, in, and if you're, if you're not familiar with graphics processing, the idea of double, bu double buffering is you don't want to draw what's on the screen on the screen because you'll actually see a flicker um, of the drawing. You'll actually see the screen go, like if this, in this case, you see the screen go white and then you'll see those words get printed and then the word read and then that line and then this. As So if you, if you actually draw graphics on the screen, it looks really glitchy uh, because what's happening is you're seeing all the steps in between of the drawing, okay? In double buffering in graphics, what happens is you have an off-screen copy of your screen, you do all your drawing to update the graphics, and then you just paste the whole screen back on top of it, and so you don't get that kind of ghosting refresh rate, okay? If you've ever seen that on a, maybe a crudely programmed graphics program, you see this kind of like I don't know, ghosting, and it seems like it's it's redrawing the screen from scratch. Most graphics programs now use a double buffering scheme, basically. Again, you, you have an off-screen copy of what's on screen. You do all your drawing there, and then you just paste the whole thing on the screen, uh, and it alleviates this kind of ghosting effect. Um, I don't know why more people don't do this with audio. You know, you, yeah, okay. So it, you want to cop, you want to have uh, uh, the input f uh, when you ask for a new sound file, you uh, you uh, you load it into a new buffer, wait till you actually need that buffer, and then start pointing to it, basically. So that's what we're trying to get working. And that's a process of kind of building up. And I'm, I'm slipping through these. Right? So I'm building up from the TT matrix class to the sample matrix to build a double buffer, basically, that every time you load a new sound file, unless you're actually going to start using that sound file, if something is still using it, the audio will still be there, so you won't get these glitches of... <laughs> automatic uh, quick shifts in your audio because you loaded a new sound file, which happens a lot with MSP buffers if you use them uh, to, any, to any level of rigor, I guess, basically, and you're, and you're loading files dynamically, okay? Things that are moving down then are the double buffering, the interpolation. This was all handled in the granular externals because I didn't have access to what Cycling74 was doing with their SDK, okay? So now we're trying to move that down in the framework, basically. I've got three more months in Norway to work on this, so that's where, kind of where we're at. Uh, and I, I'm out of time, so that's why I'm kind of <laughs> glossing over this, basically. So I realize everybody's hungry and want lunch, right? Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, we have time. Yeah. Just a short one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, I uh, hope you can visit Trondheim, because we've been working a lot with granular synthesis in mm. CSAM. Okay, yeah. I made this Hadron plugin. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because it would be very interesting to talk, discuss this stuff. Uh, sure, sure. So. Yeah, I've got I have uh, one trip to Frankfurt planned in uh, November, but uh, other than that, I have no travel plans. I just talking to John a little bit about Trumsel. So, yeah, I'm interested to see a little bit more of the rest of the country. I've been kind of back and forth between Bergen and Oslo, so it's time to Thank venture, you. venture forth. Yeah, definitely.
Any other questions? Yeah, it's actually questions. Okay. Or you can talk to me during lunch, of course. Okay, yeah, you can ask questions during lunch. That's that yeah, that would be fine too. I mean, where I'm at now, I'm, as I'm working on the, the matrix class and getting uh, I mean, the latest thing that I'm working on is the boundary handling. What happens if you ask for something that's out of bounds? Okay, do you just simply give whatever data is there, which nobody really wants that, right? So you want to make sure that you point people back into the buffer, basically. Do you fold over? Do you wrap? I'm getting those kind of functionalities working. Uh, so effectively, I'm, I'm building a better buffer inside of Jamoma, basically, for handling uh, loading audio files. Uh, that'll hopefully have some features that are not in the MSP buffer, so it'll be, you know, build a better mousetrap right now. So I'm building a better audio buffer, basically, is what I'm try trying to do right now. It's not glamorous, <laughs> but uh, it needs to be done, basically, in order to get all of this working. Uh, because uh, I, I keep having to remind myself that this is a lot of features that I was building into this the, the top level of the granular externals that I'm now trying to move, that, that I guess compensate for deficiencies in what I saw in the buffer, right? And I'm trying to now put those solutions down a layer in the audio buffer so that it will improve audio buffering for everybody, basically. Yeah, uh, Is this, uh, this three months that we have left in, in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, does it come out, your, your a random toolkit with Jamoma, does it come out with the next release of Jamoma or? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to get it for 0.6, because 0.6 is still in beta, so I'm trying to get something working inside of 0.6. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, as soon as I'm, it, I, I mean, I, I like to push things out and get people using them, basically, so. Uh, I mean, and it was a conscious decision, to, I mean, we, we can talk about bottom and top, right? I mean, it was a conscious decision to not just pull my externals in and then rework the patches so that they were uh, Jamoma modules. It was a conscious decision to first build new externals inside of the Jamoma framework and then build patches that, that work on those. those uh, so uh, there's still that layer of building the kind of higher level effects. This is not just uh, creating individual grains. We want to have higher level effects like the granular toolkit had. There's one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, regarding Jamoma, and mm -hmm. there already exists um, the AG framework, AG granular. Mm, right. For FTM, that's FTM based. Yeah, he's using FTM and, and yeah, so we're kind of building in C++ yeah. a new kind of framework for a uh, new kind of back engine, I guess, if you will, to borrow that term, uh, uh, for producing grains inside the Jamoma framework. Well, what now? With uh, uh, the guy that did the AG. Uh, I've had, I mean, uh, we've been in kind of like what we call board meetings, which is really just all of us getting on Skype and discussing these things, <laughs> uh, these issues. Uh, but uh, we haven't kind of talked head to head as far as what he's doing. But I, I mean, once it's in place, I don't see why his patches that are at this level could start using a different back engine here, uh, which might give him some uh, efficiency thing uh, gains. So, all right. But maybe you will be here later. Also. Yeah, I'm here yeah. through so, the rest of the symposium. So if anybody has other questions for me, uh, and I'll also be talking a little bit more about my music this afternoon. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.